For me, foraging, first of all, is a way for people to directly connect with nature. And I think if people are more connected to nature, they're going to want to look after it and preserve it. Biodiversity on the Isle of Man is really important and I'm trying to show how biodiverse entities such as beaches and glens and forests, like they can be a really valuable food source too, rather than just toxic monocultures, for example. There are so many different things you could forage, but I'd always say start with wild garlic because it's something you can't really go wrong with. The smell of it itself makes it so easy to identify. So when it's just coming up, we'll use the young leaves to garnish dishes to say like, oh, look how early the season is this year. It's too early and then spark that conversation. Um, and then the stalks itself, like the stems, we'll chop up finely. We make like chutneys, pickle it, do loads of different stuff, dressings, um, puree it as well and get that in the freezer. And then the leaves itself, obviously we'll use fresh. Also we'll blanch them and then blitz them and emulsify it with like local oil and have it as like a um, sauce or mayonnaise or we use the whole leaves roasted and then brushed with wild garlic oil as a, as a garnish on a nice dish. But then the flowers itself, dried and powdered, you have like, you know how you'd have like uh, garlic powder on your pantry? That would be our version of, but from drying and blitzing the flowers. Um, wild parsley or cow parsley or alexander's is probably the next one because again it's got a really distinctive smell um it's an umbrella for though so if you start looking at that kind of region there are some things to avoid but alexander's once you know what they are they're so easy to identify and they grow literally everywhere it's also invasive so it's worth picking look at all the alexander's yeah so we'll be collecting this at at the minute to get all the pollen and then we'll use it to like season fish and then have like loads of jars of this on the dry store for the winter. The pollen itself you yeah. use? I had no idea. We've got a dish on this week actually it's like a celeriac steak with fermented celeriac and then a puree of alexander because alexander tastes like celery. Um, hairy bittercress a lot of people will know that. It's um, a really small weed and it grows in the nooks and crevices of pretty much everyone's garden and footpaths and everywhere just be careful where you pick it because obviously dogs a basic thing you could forage is elderflower um, again distinctive smells things you want to start foraging uh, basics i always go by the smell personally as a chef then the taste for some reason but elderflower you really can't go wrong it everyone knows what elderflower smells like so i definitely start there and then go with basic flowers like daisies are edible for example um these these are edible, just red campions. Um, flowers are really, really easy to identify. And the most common one, let's be honest, is dandelions. You can't go wrong with dandelions. You can eat the root and um, the stem. You can make a honey using the, the heads. We dry the leaves for decoration in the restaurant. Obviously the root has a lot of uh, health benefits, but just the leaves, wilt them, use them fresh in salads, pickle them, dry them. Honestly, you can do so much. And what are these? These are the seed heads from, from the sorrel. So these are going to get dried out, blitzed up as a lovely little apple seasoning. It will go particularly well with fish or celeriac. And then we'll save these on the dry store until apples are in season and then show how a wild ingredient can taste just like apples. Now this is something that I'm totally blown over by because I've known plantain for many years as a healing herb, as a skincare herb, but the flowers or the flower heads, when they're young, they taste like mushrooms. Pippa. Yeah, so before they get the little ring of flowers around them, you break them in half and nibble it and it literally tastes like mushrooms. So in the restaurant, we can make these into sauces or dry them or deep fry them. <laughs> and yeah, we have wild mushrooms, which we are more certain of because it's plantain. This is what I mean about the Isle of Man. Everything grows everywhere. So we're not even on the beach. And then this is sea beet or sea spinach. So it's a lovely waxy leaf. And for us in the restaurant, we don't use spinach. We just, we just use this. 
you can literally just pick it, wash it and wilt it down. Um, if you have an arty farty restaurant like we do, we'll take a little ring and stamp it out into discs and use it as a garnish. We also make a wild herb blend and when we do one that's kind of seaside based and inspired by the sea, like this one will be dried and put into there as well. It's also a really nice juice and it's just really refreshing. So we've just stumbled across some sea radish. Um, so it's currently in its second year of growth, it's biannual. So if you look over here, you can see it in its first year. Um, but essentially this is a sea radish. So if we were to dig this up, there would literally be a radish root, the same way you would get with a horseradish, the invasive one in your garden. Um, as a forager and out and about, it is actually illegal to uproot anything. So if I wanted to get some of this, I'd have to have a good friend with their own beach and dig it up from there. You have to have the landowner's permission um, if you're going to uproot anything at all. What have you found? It's that sea spaghetti and sea lettuce. So most seaweeds aren't toxic, there's only a couple that are um, and I found one of them and um, so this is witch's hair or, Oh, for or, obvious reasons <laughs> <laughs> Or acid kelp and um, this one you can't eat for several reasons but if you google that, acid kelp basically and then as, this, as the tide goes out you're going to get different seaweeds and this is like number one and number three so this is gut weed so this is the one we spoke about, about using for bread but then this one, I think you can guess why. This is called sea lettuce. And this is really umami richness. So when this is dried out, we add it into soups and stocks. And it's also just nice when it's lightly pickled. It's also nice if you roll it up tightly and then slice it thinly or chiffonade it if you're a chef. I think one of the things that most appeals to me with um, foraging food is that you really connect with the season again. What's the season anymore? Who knows? But when you forage, then you can really, you can really work with the season. Um, as a restaurant that only really uses local produce and a lot of forage stuff, it's really important for us to preserve these ingredients so that we have something to use all winter. Because of, of course, in the winter, um, things can be pretty scarce and there's not much about. So um, fermentation is really useful. So let's just use wild garlic as an example, because as I say, it's one of the first ones that you can learn really easily. Um, different stages of the plant, obviously, as the season progresses, you're going to have different parts. So the first thing is going to be the roots, the ramps. Um, these are amazing fermented. So my general rule of thumb, after working in some good restaurants in Denmark, um, it seems to be 2% salt is, is the perfect, the optimum amount of salt to preserve it and increase the flavour whilst also making sure no bacteria grows. So let's just say right now this was, this was wild garlic bulbs and I wanted to preserve it. I would not wash the bulbs, you can if you like, and then I'd whack it in a jar, 2% of its weight in salt, massage it so that the ingredients started to sweat so it would draw out some of the fluid. And then some things you won't need to add any water to because there'll be enough water content, like a cucumber or a courgette. Um, but if it doesn't sweat enough and then weigh it down, um, if it doesn't sweat enough, you can top it up with boiled and then cooled water afterwards. But it's really important that it's anaerobic and that the ingredient doesn't come out the top of the water um, because air equals mold essentially. So 2% of whatever it is in its weight of salt um, covered by water 
and then just leave it for as long as you like and taste it as you go. Each ingredient is going to have an um, optimum, optimum kind of time for the flavour you want. Us at Versa, for example, we'd leave it a whole year. Another technique for drying the ingredients at Versa, particularly herbs um, and flowers and leaves, is just to dry them. So getting an, a dehydrator is a really useful investment, um, but also you could just use an arger or a windowsill in the sun as well. But yeah, as soon as you dry something, you're going to get a lot more flavour from it. So dried herbs, obviously you only need a little bit and they go a long way because almost drying them increases the flavour. We will dry all the wild garlic leaves so that in the winter we have a constant supply of garlic. The Alexander leaves for a celery flavour. We dry out elderberries um, so that we have fruit in the winter, even apples. Yeah, drying things out, just make sure it's completely dry um, because there's nothing worse than foraging a lot of stuff and going to all that effort and then drying it and then putting it in a jar when it's not quite dry and coming back to a jar of mouldy wastefulness. By just using and showcasing a few ingredients each week on the menu, one, we don't have to take much, but two, the idea is just to show people what there is, how useful they can be, how delicious they can be, and then hopefully people will have a greater understanding of what there is and appreciate it more and respect it and therefore want to look after it. So that's the goal with the restaurant. But also, as a chef, food can be very boring, so by then foraging opens up a whole new pantry and also increases my love of being a chef again. And for me, being a chef, I feel like I can really make a lot of change because I choose where my ingredients come from and support the food systems I believe in.